Okay, thank you and welcome everybody. My name is Kirsten Corbin. I'm an Executive Manager of Programs Group at Vic Health. Um, first of all, welcome so much to everybody uh, for being here at this Health Promotion Insights event. Um, we have in the room, we have about 150 or so people who are attending um, in the room today, and we've also got around 125 people online and maybe more sort of jumping online this morning. So when you think about the size of the audience, it's fantastic to get so many people to come along um, to a conversation like this, not just uh, in person, but also uh, through the digital media. So that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters upon which we meet today. Um, on all of our behalves, pay respects to elders past and present and also acknowledge any Aboriginal people uh, who may be here today. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I'll just give a little bit of background and context for what we, what we can expect um, today. But this Health Promotion Insights event is brought to you um, in a partnership, so Vic Health being one of those partners, but also the Sandro De Mayo Foundation um, being another partner bringing this event today. So many people in the room would know Sandro and the work that he's done um, and the recent formation of his foundation uh, is really exciting for us at Vic Health and really keen to work alongside Sandro and his team um, to create some change into the future. Um, not just in this particular event, but we're also working together around Festival 21. Um, so many, many of you will start to hear about that um, upcoming event. That'll be very exciting as well. So one of the big issues we're really keen to explore today um, is where the power of food really lies. Um, so we're going to hear perspectives from a number of panellists, but also really important, I think, to think about our own lives, our recent experiences, the food choices that we've made, um, and the influences that have been had over those choices. Um, Vic Health has done some work over recent times to really think about the influences of health, um, but also particularly the commercial influence or the commercial determinants that are arising a lot more. Um, so many of the, in the, you in the room, I'm sure, would know who Rob Moody is. Um, probably many of you have heard Rob speak. Um, about the unhealthy tactics um, of the food industry and how they're impacting on our health um, as well. So we'll be drawing upon some of that information. And what you see up here is a slide that Rob often talks to. It was created by Oxfam um, originally, but what it does around the outside of that slide, you see a whole lot of food companies um, that many of you would recognise all the time, particularly in relation to processed foods. And you start thinking, gosh, there are so many organisations, there are so many companies, but when you actually understand how this system works, there are far fewer who actually own um, all of these particular brands. So it's around 10 big food organisations that exist. Um, but again, you think about those 10 and how powerful they are, how much of the food supply they actually own and, and influence, it is quite amazing. Um, perhaps somewhat scary, I, okay, I guess, to sort of think about that reality in terms of who's influencing our choices. Um, so there's no doubt um, that eating right is so important for our health. We know when we eat well, um, we have positive impacts for our physical health, but also our mental health. And when we don't eat well, we put our health at risk um, in all of those ways. Um, more than just the health impacts of food, we understand a lot more now around what food brings for us socially. So in terms of our social connections, the interactions that we have in our culture um, overall. So I think it's really important, I guess, to value food in terms of its nutritional state, but also the cultural value um, it provides for our society too. Um, so today's event very much is around exploring the drivers of our food decisions, as I said before. So what is it that's making us uh, make all the choices that we make around what we, f what we eat and what we drink? Um, so many of those influences may be social, cultural, economic or political, um, and there's a whole lot of in interconnections within them all, so entirely um, a complicated environment. And what we want to think about now is how do we as individuals, um, health professionals, many of us, concerned community members, um, how do we start to create some change, really combat some of these negative influences that are out there um, affecting us every single day. So before I introduce the panel to everybody, I'd like to just um, touch on a couple of practical housekeeping pointers for today's session. Um, we're going to use Slido um, to support us through this session. So many of you will have used Slido before. If you haven't, um, use your device if you can. Um, jump onto Slido, so S-L-I-D-O dot com. Um, that's going to be an opportunity for you to submit questions to the panel. So you really be part of the conversation today and determine what it is that we're actually going to be talking about. Um, and also a chance for you to see what other questions um, people are raising and you can vote for those questions. Um, so myself here, I've got my device here, I'll be able to keep an eye on those questions. Adam's going to keep an eye on it as well. And where there are questions that people are really liking, really want to be, be asked, we'll actually make sure that we prioritise those for the conversation. So people in the room and people online can all contribute to Slido um, and help steer our conversation. When you get into Slido, you'll ask, be asked for an event code. 
Um, it's up there on the screen, but it's health, HP Insights, um, all lowercase and all one word. So that will get you into our space um, in Slido. Um, also, those of you who like to use Twitter, um, hashtag HP Insights uh, will be great for today's event as well. Um, so I'd like now, I guess, to introduce our panel to everybody. I've just got a brief bio for everybody um, here who's up in front of you. So starting in the far side there, first of all, is Toby Puttock. Um, Toby's blended in perfectly with his chair. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he's really very, very compliant, not wearing all black, which I have done. Um, but anyway, not wearing all black, he's worn all blue, um, a complete perfect match. So well done, Toby. So um, 2018's been a really big year for Toby. He's accepted uh, the role as creative director of Jamie's Ministry of Food, which we're well known to, to so many of us. Um, Toby has a huge interest in plant-based cooking, describing his health, himself as plant curious. Um, so we're all about diversity and inclusion. There are so many uh, different forms of that, but plant curious, uh, I think, is a great one. Um, that's resulted in the release of his fifth cookbook titled Supernatural. Um, so we've done some work with, with Toby before, and I personally find his story uh, very inspiring. Um, somebody who's a very well-known chef and who's made some really genuine changes um, to support health. Thank you, Toby, for being here. Um, Katinka, uh, there, there in the middle. Um, Katinka actually works with Choice. Um, so she's a campaign and policies team lead, um, and she's responsible for their food and health policy areas. Um, Katinka made her way down from Sydney this morning, perfectly timed, um, even used the airport bus to get here, so some great choices there. Um, within her time at Choice, Katinka has successfully advocated for improved country of origin and free range egg labels, and has fought for improved business practices of multinational food companies. Katinka's favourite food experience has been bringing vegetables to the Choice office. Um, this bit made me laugh. So Katinka's had a side hustle salad business uh, and sells healthy vegetarian salads to her colleagues at work each week. Thank you, Katinka. Um, nearest to me is Kirsten. Um, Kirsten's the co-founder of the Open Food Network. So it's a global network of people and tools building sovereign and sustainable food distribution systems. Um, Kirsten's an also research fellow um, at Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute at the University of Melbourne. Um, currently working on food print in Melbourne. One of her favourite food moments was becoming aware that not everyone passionately counts potatoes, then discovering that strange family behaviour may be related to the Irish potato famine. <laughs> so keen to hear some more about that, Kirsten. Uh, and then over, the final person there, we have Zach Lewis. Um, Zach's from Food Bank Victoria. Uh, I've got Zach's profile here on my phone. Um, we would like to say big thanks to Zach because he's jumped in last minute um, to fill a gap on this panel. Uh, probably as late as this morning, so really appreciate that, Zach. There are degrees of last minute. Yeah, this one's really very last minute. So, uh, Zach is a community development manager at Food Bank, Victoria. Um, he started his career as a marine biologist. Are there any other marine biologists in the room? No. So you're on your own there, Zach. That's, that's great. Zach swapped his wetsuit for a tie to follow his keen interest in community development. Zach now leads Food Bank's program development and delivery of community food relief programs across Victoria. His most memorable food experience is fresh sushi at the Tokyo Fish Markets. Okay, Zach, again, thank you so much uh, for your presence today. Um, so I'll kick off with a question to the panel, but keep in mind questions you would like to ask you, Slido, um, throughout the session as well. That'd be great. So my opening question, I'll post to the whole panel and then you can each take a chance um, at responding to this. Probably sounds like a really simple question, um, but I'd like you to have a go at it anyway. Um, basically, we know many people believe um, it's a simple answer of individual choice. So it's up to each of us individually to make our choices around what goes into our mouths, what food and what drink. But from your perspective, who makes the choice about what do we eat? Where exactly does that power lie? So Would you like me to jump in? You can, you can jump in <laughs> first, Toby. Thank you. Well, you think, obviously, <coughs> it's the individual, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I started thinking about this question. I've, I've come across this question a lot of times. And for me, it's kind of that big graph we had up there before of the large companies really decide what we eat in many, many ways. But I like to divide this question into two bits, really. There's necessity, so we all need to eat, otherwise we die. Um, we all need to eat a lot of vegetables, we don't. Um, but we're also, and then the other kind of side of the story is fun, which is where we have food trends and cool restaurants and Instagram pics and stuff like that. So. Food trends is an interesting one, especially in this country. If you go to Italy and places like Rome and lots of countries, food trends aren't really huge. They're old countries. A lot of years ago, I did a keynote speech for about 
two hours. So I did a lot of research on that. And I had to think about food trends of where they actually come from. And so I delved and delved and delved into it. And I realised in Australia, all the food trends we have uh, come from countries where we don't have a large population here. So we don't have many Mexican people in this country. Mexicans huge in this country, <laughs> as is American food. And so the list goes on. So then it basically made me realise, OK, well, you know, Italian food, we have a lot of Italians. Greek, we have the biggest Greek community outside of Athens in Melbourne here. Greek food isn't trendy. George Columbaris would disagree. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it is amazing food, don't get me wrong, but it hasn't got that buzz about it because we're unfamiliar to it. Um, and it so happens these foods where we have Mexican and we have the American style food as well have all the elements that make food really exciting to us. So there's uh, a lot of fat, salt, acid, heat and all those kind of things which make it really exciting for us to eat. Um, and they're a little bit naughty as well, like we shouldn't really have deep fried Bell's chicken every single day. <laughs> but as food trends and Instagram and all these things happen, we start to be inundated with this into our lives. So then for a lot of people it does start to happen every single day. Now, on the other side of food trends for me we have necessity. So. Someone said to me, oh, have you gone vegan? And I was like, no, I haven't gone vegan. I wrote a plant-based book. The funny thing is we're supposed to eat now five serves of vegetables every single day. If you put, so that's what, two and a half a meal, putting our breakfast aside. If you put all those veggies on a plate, it's a lot of food that we're supposed to have. So therefore, we all should be eating largely plant-based if you look at it like that. Because if anyone can eat that many veggies in 300 gram steak, Amazing. Um, so for me, we should be reducing the amount of protein we're having and having more veggies because that's what the stats are telling us to do. Uh, anyone want to jump in on this? Um, sure, I can. I, well, I think when it comes to what we eat, I think there's conscious and subconscious forces at play. Um, the biggest deciding factor for people when they're making a decision about food is always price. Consumer surveys always tell us mm. that price is the number one factor. And that doesn't even matter if they say that other things like animal welfare, environment, country of origin are really important. Um, you know, buying behaviour shows that they'll be dictated by price. Then you have the more subconscious factors, um, you know, like the diagram we saw, the food and beverage industry has so much influence, um, you know, and it's a highly unregulated environment for them to operate in, which means they can freely push unhealthy, profitable foods to families, kids, adults. Um, and marketing can overcome people's perception of the truth. So, for example, um, a lot of, you know, most people would know that a can of Coke is high in sugar and not good for you, but through their marketing, Coke is able to convince a large proportion of people that if you drink Coke, it'll make you feel happier, feel more attractive, feel more fun. And then you have all the supermarket tactics. So the way that a supermarket is laid out is designed to maximise your time in the shop and increase the amount of purchases you make. So for example, the bread and the egg section is always at the back of the supermarket, which means you have to walk through all the supermarket to get there, which increases your likelihood of impulse purchases. Um, and they also know that people shop around the perimeters and then dip in and out of aisles. So they put their unhealthy, processed, but also profitable foods at the end of aisles um, and often on special. And it's human nature to be attracted to a special, which means that we end up buying a whole lot more um, unhealthy packaged foods than we, we probably would have otherwise. I did a came up with the idea for a food brand a few years ago, which was all vegan food. And I went up for a meeting, I won't say which supermarket, but I walked in and I'd been pitching for about six years to get various products in. As soon as they saw the vegan brand, because it's getting on trend right now, they jumped at it and said, we'll take it in two months. So I was selling, to give you an idea, a 300 gram container of food. So it had like a pasta, one was a curry and what have you. And then I got the, um, it went really, really well, but I got the phone call saying, we need to lower the price by 50% because $8 is a platinum price for us for a single serve meal. So I went back to the manufacturer and said, wow, we need to do something here, we need to lower the price. He said, but you're not adding any water into it. And I said, no, it's food. We put 300 grams of a container in. He said, well, if you go and look at all the other products on the shelf, which I did, I went and bought some products, about 40% of that was food. So immediate, uh, water, sorry. So we can immediately drop the cost by about 30 or 40% from our end. 
uh, which is crazy. Now, I'm going to share with you guys something I probably shouldn't, but I will. It cost, uh, they wanted to buy a product like this for $2.75. It cost $2.20 to take the same container, put water in it, and a label, and ship it to the supermarket. So it doesn't give us much money to play with with food. So when you start to look at it like this, it's almost impossible to get healthy, good food um, en masse into supermarkets. So this is becoming a huge interest of mine, is how do we disrupt this? And not everybody is Jamie Oliver or you guys who can go and cook and make nice food pretty simply. So, um, and everybody is getting super busy. So how do we get that beautiful, good, real whole food to the masses? Have you got an answer for me? Well, no, I don't have an answer because we're in the question section at yeah. the moment. So just to, just to add some other kind of like dimensions to this, you know, people have talked about what we understand about our food and what we believe about it. And I think, you know, we choose what we put in our mouths, but what's in our hand and what's in the supermarket, we have so much less choice over. Some of the things that have happened recently around honey, you know, that's not anything to do with the label, that's to do with blatant profiteering and trying to do exactly what you're talking about. And then there's the whole kind of what's actually happening on the farm. Like if that's your margin, what's happening to the farmer actually producing the food. There's some really interesting things going on like we've talked about and I guess it's much more current in the health promotion sector in Australia to be talking about this level of food processing and food manufacturing as a problem. But the same problem exists, you know, in the sort of 20 years ago, about 600 companies worldwide controlled seeds, fertilisers and pesticides. And now it's less than six, you know, and this is the consolidation and with Bayer buying out Monsanto this year, it's massive. So their incentive to keep farmers buying seeds, pesticides, fertilisers is very high. The average farm debt in Australia is over half a million dollars and 60% of them in, I think the figure is 2014, have a net, prof net negative profit. So people are, you know, farmers are controlled by the banks and by these big companies. This pressure to produce more food that we all hear about, you know, and I, you know, I'm having this thing at the moment of like, have I been part of this? You know, this thing about we need to produce more food with less resources, less water. Well, we don't. We have enough food now to feed nine or 10 billion people if we stop wasting it and if we look at diets and how we change them. Then this, um, around how we actually change what happens in agriculture when farmers actually have so little control because they are controlled by these companies. There are systems emerging in regenerative agriculture which have the potential to be massive contributors to how we deal with climate change by sequestering carbon. And the critical things about those systems are that they have perennial plants so that you don't have to keep planting them. That's not good for seed companies. That they reduce inputs that you don't have to keep fertilising because you've got your soil working. That's also not good for those big companies. And the same with pesticides. You can massively reduce the amount of... Um, chemicals basically that you need. So there's very little money going into researching or applying these systems because the companies that control our food systems don't want to go near them. They want to know about genetically modified foods, super high tech, sensor everything, you know, the things that they can continue to control. So these issues of companies and money controlling the food system run all the way back into the land-based systems and the farms, etc. And I just learned something very recently that not only do we have enough food available in the world to feed everybody, we also, most countries have enough food in those countries, produced in those countries to feed their citizens a full and healthy diet. You know, just let that sit with you for a minute because that's not what we're told about what we need to deal with in the food system and how we need to run our agriculture. And we often hear about food waste, you know, and again, this gets pushed to, you know, is this about consumers not knowing to eat beetroot leaves? You know, but when you think about what I just said, the motivator for food waste is if you're the companies that sell the seeds, the fertilisers and the pesticides, overproduction is your friend. That's exactly what you want farmers to be doing, to be getting more into debt, producing a whole lot of food that gets thrown away. So unless we actually address these issues of concentration of power deep, deep in the agricultural system. It just continues to flow through. The system is designed to make money, not to feed people. Actually, if I could, I'd just like to pick up a point you mentioned then about uh, that we have enough food to supply everyone in the country with food if they need it. Um, I come from Food Bank Victoria, so we're very much looking at uh, food relief and people that can't source food for themselves. So 
not many people realise, but in, in Australia, I think 18% of people are food insecure. So in the last 12 months, they've experienced some period where they haven't been able to put food on the table. So that's over 4 million Australians who aren't getting food regularly. Of those 4 million, about 76% or over 3 million of them are very food insecure. So that means um, direct changes to their diet um, in terms of what they're eating, skipping meals because they can't afford it, reducing the size of meals because they can't afford it. So I think it's another driver. I think you spoke earlier about you know these trends in food and, and necessity. I think there's very much a choice around necessity that a lot of Australians are making um, with food. So pr probably standing aside from those you know those um, upstream effects you're talking about with suppliers, people don't have resources in their household to be to be able to afford enough food that, that they need. So one of the examples I think um, that always strikes me is you know someone on New Start Allowance. I think Salvation Army recently showed that after accommodation expenses they have $17 a day to spend on the rest of their life. So food is becoming almost a discretionary item for some people, um, which I find really sad in Australia. You know, I love my food. Um, and I think the flow on effect is that we always assume that people are making the same food choices that we are. So, uh, you know, in terms of food insecurity, I think last year Food Bank Victoria provided 8.5 million kilos of food relief across the state, 15 million meals. It gives you some indicator of the demand. And yet we're going nowhere near meeting the demand. Um, I think we work with about 450 charity partners across the state who have direct links into the community. Um, and they're telling us that more than 50% of our partners are telling us that demand is increasing. So I guess it's kind of a bit of a stark um, you know, reminder that choices are very influenced by your socioeconomic status and your ability to purchase food. I recently had the good fortune of meeting someone who'd um, experienced homelessness and, and Emma was telling me that she had a period in her life where she had no money, she was looking for food, she um, was at the end of her um, uh, payment cycle and she had two dollars and she needed to go to the supermarket to spend that two dollars and this food needed to last her two days. So she spent an hour in the supermarket uh, trawling the aisles, looking at the packaging, trying to work out how many calories she could get for that two dollars. So I think, you know, you know, in terms of, I guess, the broader discussion, it's important to remember that some of these choices can really be constrained um, by sort of influences that are that are more um, directly socioeconomic. What did she choose? What did she choose? I'm dying to know. Yeah, <laughs> these chocolate um, cake biscuit things okay. that she said were yeah. chock full of um, calories. But she said it was the best calorie um, buy she could make for her money that would last for those couple of days. And are we still at 40% of the food being produced in this country has been thrown away right now? Correct. Yeah. Mm. 20 billion dollar food waste um, problem. Uh, you know, then you have four million Australians going food insecure. So there's a missing link there, which I think you know, um, particularly not-for-profit sector has a role in, but also government at a federal, state level, although. I sort of don't want to get ahead of the conversation, um, definitely has a role. I think there's such a critical thing because I, you know, obviously emergency food relief and matching that food waste with people who need it is a critical part of what we need to do. But it's still, it is still something that we would prefer to fix at both ends. Like it would be better if our welfare systems and our wages actually ensured that people had enough money to choose the food that they needed. And it would be better if farmers could actually get paid for all the food that, that they produce. So it's a really tricky kind of yes and situation. We need to do that whilst not believing that that is actually kind of getting at the core of the problem. I think both ends maybe are an expression of that growing wealth divide in the country. You know, I think ACOS recently said that 60% of, or Australian Co Council of Social Services, sorry, said that 60% of wealth is, is you know, um, concentrated in the very few and that the large proportion of Australia has about 1% of wealth. Yeah. So that really kind of uh, impacts farmers who we're seeing, you know, are more likely to be food insecure than metropolitan counterparts. So I think, yeah. you know, the rates of food insecurity in regional Australia are about 22%. Um, versus, you know, 17% in the city. So, you know, it's the, the farmers... It's the same worldwide. It's often usually the farmers who are food insecure. Yeah. So yeah. the farmers producing all this beautiful food, much of it being thrown away, and at the moment, what are we, 27 26% of uh, kids are overweight or obese, and it's like 63% of adults in Australia right now. Mm. Can I um, ask, I'm just looking at the online questions and doing my own reflections as well, that we can't really have a conversation around the power of anything of food in this case, uh, without talking about money. Um, so all four of you have talked about you know, financial implications in the summaries you've given so far. Um, Katinka, we talked a little bit about, um, and Zach did as well, about individuals um, and their financial situation and how that impacts um, on the choices that they, 
they make, um, consciously and subconsciously. We had examples. We've also talked about big food and the financial um, incentive they have to produce food in a certain way. Um, are there solutions? And online, there's, there's a question here as well about governance. So, you know, are there governance solutions to that, or you know, what are the approaches um, that might be able to be employed to overcome that? Because that'll be the case in 2019, 2020, 2030. You know, money is is going to continue to be um, one of those components of power. Can I maybe jump in first, just because I have a really nice framework um, that that might be useful then for you know, listening to all of our responses. There's a kind of a framework around social change that, you know, I love the things with the quadrants. And some of the things we need to do are about reimagining. It's like four R's. So we have to be able to, you know, ask the hard questions and understand what's really going on and push ourselves to reimagine systems that are outside this. We also need to reform. We need to work within the systems to get incremental changes, all of that kind of work. We need to resist, so where things are actively undermining health, etc. So some of the examples I would use would be around lock the gate and farmers resisting to protect water resources, and the same with coal mines, around people resisting around GMOs being unlabeled, you know, things like that. And then we have to recreate. We need to create systems that operate outside this, that give us uh, opportunities to do something different basically, rather than choosing between the two options that the supermarket's given us, how we build systems that enable us to access food from farmers that support farmers that look after the environment, et cetera, which I can talk more about later. But. Yep. Um, yeah, in terms of solutions, we just, we need, we need a system that prioritises regulation. You know, you almost can't blame the food and industry, the food and beverage industry for making money. That's what they're set up to do. So you need to have those checks and balances in place so that, you know, you have the needs of Australians being put first. Um, you know, choice always advocates for people to be able to make an informed choice, um, you know, and, and that should be able to happen, but it shouldn't all be on the individual to be able to make a choice. You know, we need to have proper regulation in place so that, um, you know, we can facilitate people to make healthier choices um, and, and a whole range of things. And it, and it needs to be kind of a whole of government approach as well. You know, it, there's so much intersection with food um, and other departments. So it doesn't, shouldn't just sit with Department of Health for making, you know, uh, helping people make healthier decisions. It really relies on government departments to work together and um, you know to be able to have that as a priority we need we do need people to to rise up and to call for these things as well you know at the end of the day politicians work for for people and we need to then be able to demonstrate that people want change in this area I think we've also what's interesting we've lost a generation of cooks as well so most people I know don't know how to cook and so I, I'm crave director of this thing that basically teaches people in low socioeconomic areas how to cook basic food and to spend for themselves um, and it's it's very upsetting when you see what these people on a day eat on a day-to-day -day basis. 43% of, uh, I'm full of stats, 43% of um, vegetable intake in this country is chips across all vegetables. It's true. And uh, when we go and ask young children, we have a Learn Your Fruit and Veg program, which basically goes and teaches kids about produce and, you know, they're not working with fry pans and knives because they're three and they're, and they're three to 12. But we're basically trying to get them excited. And we've started this program because we find dealing with the adults it's a bit of a dead end in, in some areas. Like, it's really hard. So we've, we still do the program, but we're now going to the kids because if we can go with the kids and then they go home and say, Mom, I learned about broccoli today, can we have this? Then we're doing half of the heavy lifting for the parents. Yeah. Um, and we're getting staggering results. We piloted that program earlier this year and now we're doing about 1,000 kids a week through the program. Mm -hmm. So it's good. I think that's amazing. 43% so, of our vegetable intake is potatoes. Oh, that's a heap of potatoes to count. The biggest, <laughs> yeah. the biggest yeah. Uber uh, send out is Macca's chips. Yep. Wow. People will pay $5 extra to get the chips delivered to their house. True story. That's because of all the sugar. Oh, Seriously yeah. Addictive. <laughs> Salt tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question online. People are looking that's, that's got a heap of likes. Mm. Um, everyone wants me to ask this question, so I'm going to ask it now if that's okay. Um, but are there simple tactics we can employ as consumers or as communities to put pressure on supermarkets, food manufacturers, etc., to drive better products and systems? Stop buying sugary products. If you stop buying sugary products, they'll stop stocking them. 
So it's, it's as simple as that. We just we just change our choices. Well, I have a counter yeah, to I that. So. <laughs> um, well, I. I think it's really important for people to believe that they actually do have the power to change the food system. Um, so an example of that is we're running a campaign at the moment for added sugar labelling because despite dietary advice to reduce sugar intake, food manufacturers aren't required to label how much sugar they add to foods. And they use about 40 different words for sugar in the ingredient list. So if you're actually trying to buy less sugary foods, it's actually really difficult. So we ran a campaign two years ago, which started with a report that found if we had added sugar labelling, we could remove 38 kilograms of unnecessary sugar from our diets. Um, and we called on our supporters, our campaign supporters, to email health ministers, and 12,000 people emailed health ministers. In response, ministers tasked our food standards agencies to look into the issue a bit further. So then last year we teamed up with the Australian Dental Association to look at the health implications, uh, the dental implications of sugar. Um, and this time we asked people to call their health ministers and 50 people told us that they spoke with the health minister's office about this issue. Then health ministers agreed that sugar labelling was a problem in Australia and they've actually released seven potential solutions this year which range from just basic sugar labelling to warning labels that would warn you about how much sugar is in your product. Now, ministers meet next Friday to discuss this and we're asking people to hand write letters to health ministers regarding this issue and every day I'm getting an email from our supporters with a picture of them at the post box or them with their letter saying that they have written to their health ministers. Now, it's not over yet, but for sure there's one thing that, that ministers can't ignore when they meet next Friday is that people really care about this issue and I think we just, we have to get active if we believe about something in the food industry and I don't think it's easy to think that one letter or one call won't make a difference but if you're doing that in, in you know in combination with lots of like-minded individuals it certainly can have an impact what about yeah. we know smoking is obviously bad for you we started getting the warnings on the packets and then the tax came in i remember when i was young i used to smoke and it was four bucks it was great now it's like 35 dollars a packet do we not do this with sugary products yeah well there's a lot of people in the sector trying to get that because price is such a as a huge um, factor into why people buy things and so if sugary sweetened beverages were more expensive you know it, it could create an incentive for people to choose um, lower sugar options such as water um, and then you perhaps you know the government can raise money to put towards health initiatives it's, yeah exactly so you know it makes sense from our perspective but uh, you, there's incredible amount of blowback from from the, the beverage industry they wouldn't be happy no <laughs> and a whole range of tactics that they're using to you know counter this happening mm. in Australia so it's really is, it can be really difficult, but you know, especially even just getting basic labelling changes. But you know, I think there is this a uh, huge groundswell um, of organisations in this space who are calling for these changes. And the more individuals and organisations that can join onto that, the better, because the more powerful it makes us against the food and beverage industry. Mm. I think that's absolutely fantastic, and I want to do a yes and because I absolutely believe in empowered consumers writing letters and government, citizens, all of that, those things. I think another really good way to send messages to the supermarket is to not shop there. Um, and for people who, as many of us probably are, we do have options. There are lots of people working to provide ethical, well-produced, um, sustainable, basically what we call values-based supply chains. You know, they look after the, the farmers, they make sure the food has actually got nutrition in it, all the workers are paid fairly, and it's keeping money rotating in communities. So this ranges from, you know, the obvious things like farmers, markets, community-supported agriculture, um, food hubs where you're aggregating and providing food. People have a, a response around this is necessarily more expensive. Well, actually, it's not necessarily more expensive. We've had students go in and do uh, food market assessments of some of the food hubs in, say, the southeast of Melbourne, and you can get a really good you know, selection because they're giving you what's seasonal, what's affordable, you know, what's well produced, it's fresh, it lasts a long time in the fridge. So it, a lot of this is connected to education and understanding vegetables and what to do with vegetables. But a lot of these uh, organisations, community food enterprises in communities are playing a lot of that role of educating people as well as social connection through food. So that's really what what we're focused on is supporting this sector of enterprises that are outside the supermarket chains 
that are providing food to communities in a way that is ethical and fair and affordable, whilst also driving the kind of environmental food production that we need. So for people who have an option, as if any of you are living in the city, you have options to be buying online, whether it's through the Open Food Network, which is us. We also work with Series Fair Food. We help them with all their software systems and Food Connect in Brisbane. There are options, so and it's really hard to compete against the supermarkets if you're trying to provide really strong environmental benefits as well as really strong social benefits as well as pay people fairly it's really hard to compete with supermarkets so if you find something that you can possibly make work and stick with them because these people are the ones creating creating the options and alternatives and does that put pressure on supermarkets hell yeah you know they they've started introducing organic seasonal you know veggie boxes in Woolworths online and they started putting the, you know the pictures of the farmers you know they're six massive farmers that they buy from, you know, they're starting to promote those. So it's like the message that people are interested in this does, you know, push back to the supermarkets and, yeah, people not shopping there has an impact on them. Yeah, I must admit, I have to agree with everyone that's, you know, the points you make about using your sort of choices as a consumer to kind of drive change. I think that's the way, if you have, but, but it does require your own change because I think of, you know, as a different example outside of food, you know, the Banking Royal Commission where you hear about, you know, these horrible practices by the big four banks. Um, and, you know, we haven't seen large scale moves of um, customer base away from those banks. So, you know, we kind of acknowledge the problem and we look at it and we kind of go, that's horrible, I don't want to be a part of that, but it actually requires you to take your business elsewhere. And I think that's the, you know, you know, supermarkets are so convenient, um, the locations are, you know, usually very close to where you live. I think it actually requires that kind of, you know, maybe a loss in convenience um, and a change in your own behaviour. Because if you support those kind of um, alternate models, you know, we've all sort of discussed, um, it, it provides the incentive to get into that industry by business and it provides the opportunity um, for innovation uh, and for the cost to come down. So I think you've got to absolutely use, um, you know, your power as a consumer to sort of change your own behaviour. All right. That's great. Thank and you, everybody. write all the letters and support the campaigns yes. because obviously yes. there are people who, you know, are under a lot of pressure, like a lot of people in a lot of debt with the kids and, you know, all of the rest of it who are not going to be doing all of the reading and all of the information and they've got 60 cents to spare maybe in a week, you know, I get it. So it's kind of like you need to be bringing up the, the labelling and the people. So they're under pressure, they want to do the right thing and just give me the information simply, like that's got to be there as well. It's not an either or. It's funny, without the appropriate labelling, as you were saying, I think having that warning on something's absolutely brilliant. Without that, all the young people are blinded to what's going on. They really are. And it just uh, freaks me out that we don't have food education in schools right now. So it's like such a basic survival skill, being able to cook for yourself. Otherwise, you die, and uh, as I keep saying, and um, but you, you need to know how to do this. At school, I learnt Latin. I haven't learnt Latin since you know since I left that classroom. And but when I left school, I didn't know how to boil an egg, and then I became a chef. All was good. But um, <laughs> what we're really pushing to do through the work we do at the ministry is to make it compulsory in schools. You know, maybe not next year, but in the next ten years. Yeah. That's so important, especially for, you know, certain segments of the population. I think for some, like, uh, teenage boys, they're consuming up to something like 38 teaspoons of added sugar a day. Oh and, you know, that's all through sugar-sweetened beverages. And and we, we need to increase education in, in those, you know, key areas. Yeah. I think that's great. We've got a lot of great questions online. You guys are jumping into answering some of these naturally as you go. I just want to check in the room. Is there anyone in the room here who's got a question they would like to pose? Pose live. No? Yeah, the front here. Sorry, we've got the front first. Uh, there's a mic for you. Um, in terms of the labelling and, and lobbying for government to make that compulsory, how much do you, do we have any idea on cost in terms of what, aside from uh, lobbying from the big companies to the government to not do such a thing, the actual cost of making it happen, would that be a significant cost to the government or is it just more of an inconvenience? Um, the, look, 
the food and beverage industry will say it'll cost them a lot of money, um, but actually if you have a look at a product like Milo, it changes its packaging like every six months. So really, <laughs> that's not an issue. You know, all of the, a lot of the products in the supermarket are fast moving consumer goods. Um, and so the, the labeling cost is a bit of a farce. Um, you know, from the government perspective, you know, there's the, the perhaps the governance of it, but you know, these are, these are things, the costs that should be embedded in government anyway. We already regulate the labeling of so many aspects of a food product, especially in regards to, you know, food safety, allergens and such. So improving that for consumers actually would create more of a benefit in that it would help them make healthier choices, a whole range of um, other benefits. Um, and, and, and from a government perspective, it's only really setting up the changes that need to be made and, and you know, from a compliance perspective, perspective perhaps there's um, small costs there, but it, it's really negligible um, and, um, but the, the industry will always have you think otherwise. Thank you. There was a question, someone in, in a blue t-shirt, blue top there. Thanks, Fu. Yep. Uh, so considering cultural impacts and things like that. How important do you think it is looking back to our development as a nation to understanding why we eat the food that we do? Because if you look back to Australia's settlement, we've always had quite a poor diet and quite a meat heavy diet. Uh, so do you think it's important to educate people as well of how we got to where we are rather than just now saying that these foods are better for you and these foods will like be able, the, and the importance of cooking for yourself and things like that. Such a big question. Mm -hmm. That's a big question, mm. yes. Uh, Hang on, we go. <laughs> I think that there's, look, I mean, I'll just say a few things and I'm sure people will jump in. Like, there's so much in that in terms of Australia as a colonial exporter of sheep and wheat, you know, as being, that's a big part of what it was about. Um, but then our diets have changed so much with cult cultural influences so that things like Mediterranean diets and Asian diets, you know, have brought a whole lot of things in. So our diet in some ways is probably, you know, more diverse than it would have been as a traditional kind of English colonial diet. I think some of the stuff that is most interesting, and again, this is, you know, probably out in the more radical fringe, but some of the stuff that is going on in Australia that is just really interesting is a much better understanding of indigenous food production and indigenous farming and the kinds of things that were being produced and how they were produced here before the settlers came. So the possibilities of actually recreating agricultural systems here that actually work for the ecosystems that we have here, whether they be perennial grasses and grains eating more non-ruminant animals like kangaroos, but also, you know, what you were saying, I think the role of animals like sheep and cows in restoring our landscapes is significant, but the number of them that we need is going to be way, way less than what we're currently producing. So some of these very hard questions about what actually a climate-friendly diet in a country like Australia is are things that we're going to have to address. And I think it's very fortunate that they align with what the very similar kind of direction around what we actually need for healthy diets. So I think this has been something I'm, I guess, passionate about for years is how these, these forces are kind of running in the same direction, the kind of thing that people are going to need to eat and the cultural challenges that we're going to have to have around that. Um, so I think, and what we were talk, you were saying before about, you know, teenage boys and 38 teaspoons of sugar, you know, somehow this has to be exciting and what's happening in the vegan, this kind of vegan trend, you know, I think a lot of that is environmental. A lot of that is young people being concerned about, you know, their impact as well as health. So it's kind of riding that and going, well, that's part of the answer, but it's actually not the whole answer. But for, to drive a kind of cultural change around, actually, we want to eat a diet that we know is good for our health. And then that kind of, you know, filters back yeah. out into the rest of society. We hope. We hope. <laughs>
Well. <laughs> There's so much, um, as I was saying before, resistance to the whole... People get very scared of the vegan word, I think. I remember I'm 44 years old when I was growing up, there was, you know, normal people, vegetarian in those caftan wearing vegans over here. And um, it, it's not that way anymore. We, and with this book I've written, it's like people get scared of it. It's like no one's forcing you to go vegan. We're just asking you to not eat so much crap, eat more veggies, um, cook a little bit out of this book and have your minute steak on the side there as well. That's fine. But for all these reasons you mentioned before, whether it's health, environmental uh, or ethical reasons, it's a good thing to do. And just having that small amount, if everybody ate half as much meat as they're eating now, they'd probably not only feel better because they'd be eating more vegetables, but the environmental impact would be huge. Depending on how the meat is produced. But yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Fu, was there one more question from... Yep. Great. Hi, guys. Um, before you mentioned about price being the main driver um, in people's choice for food and not taking away from Food Bank and the job you're doing there and the fact that there's certainly a group of our population that are very much struggling, but there's also a larger group that are not struggling yet. We've been educated almost, I think, by the duopoly to go by price. A long time ago, the word cheap used to be a bad thing. And it seems like now for food it's a good thing and I think we've lost that ability to understand quality and the work that goes into good fresh produce and I think that the supermarkets are perhaps using that against farmers markets and those sorts of alternative supplies. How do we get people back to remembering that f sourcing your food for yourself and your family used to be one of the most important and also enjoyable aspects of life, used to bring community together because we did it together and you know how do we reverse that trend that's well that you know, influence that's sort of told us that cheap is good and fast is good and, you know, yeah. I think the, my first part of the answer to that is about value and as a conversation with people about the difference between cheap and the difference between value for money and I think that does hold with people. But then on a more, um, I guess, optimistic, also this this movement of reconnection with farmers and accessing good food and connecting with communities through food is growing wildfire. You know, we started the Open Food Network in Australia five years ago, and we're now operating in seven countries with new countries coming on all the time. And this is about a software and a network of people supporting these alternative distribution models all over the world. It's everywhere. And when we sit, you know, and start trying to do the numbers and trying to work out what's going on, the number of, you know, community food hubs, farmers, cooperatives, all of these things, you know, it's growing exponentially everywhere. And the more that it does grow and the diversity of those models in local places, uh, the more momentum it gets. You know, the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance here in Australia uh, has had significant impacts on the changes to the planning laws in Victoria around, you know, there was an attempt this year to shut down kind of free range pig and chicken farming in the green wedges. And it's been the kind of getting organised of this sector and really strong political lobbying about the difference between an intensive chicken free range farm and what is happening in these low input extensive systems that has meant that these kind of small farms that are often selling directly very transparently in close connection with their customers are actually still able to keep operating in the green wedges you know, around the city. So, yeah, the movement is actually strong and growing quickly. So that's, again, I just encourage you to get involved because it is exciting. But I also think truth and labelling is really important. So if you look at free-range eggs, for example, before 2016, there was no national standard for free-range eggs in Australia. So it really made it difficult for people to pay double the amount for free-range eggs because they didn't have the trust that they are actually getting what they were paying for. So if we have true labels that people can trust, then they're going to be more likely to pay the premium to be able to support better welfare practices or to support producers. Um, and that's and that's why we, we always we always advocate for better labelling because it, it does have such an implication for the whole food system. If I could just bring you back to the point you're talking about sort of cheap foods viewed better and, and what's driving that. Um, I think like we've just had a state election here in Victoria, cost of living was very much a part of that discussion and it's more broadly a part of um, the federal discussion as well. I think that resonates for a lot of people when you have um, increasing rates of mortgage stress, um, sort of static rates of wage growth, underemployment, 
Um, people are more concerned about how they're spending money and I think that translates in some way to the food system as well. So that kind of sense of value you were talking about before, you want to get value for money, um, but you also want to keep, um, you know, your spending uh, limited in some respect. So I think outside of people that are maybe suffering um, food insecurity or experiencing food insecurity, I think it's more broader than that, that there is, you know, cost of living implications um, that we're seeing sort of drive some of those choices, potentially. I did some snooping around online in the vegan forums under a weird name, basically to get some intel of what people want. And uh, the question I asked was, would you be happier to go to a, one of the not large three supermarkets and to a smaller, um, you know, grocer or what have you, and pay a little bit more for a product you know is is uh, a good product using great produce and it doesn't have any additives and stuff like that? And I thought they're all going to come back and say yes. 80, 90% of them came back and said, no, nah, would rather get it at the cheapest, pro at vegan product we're talking here, would rather get the cheapest price possible. Um, that's all they cared about. Hmm. And I was, I was amazed. I thought with this kind of genre of person, they're going to be worrying about the environmental effects of what they're eating, but they're not, the, not the case. No, no. Interesting, isn't it? One more question here. Thanks. Hi. Uh, sugar and the sugar industry and the actual system, uh, what are we asking the sugar cane and the cane grower farmers and the families to diversify their products into different uses? I mean, we as the consumers are all saying perhaps this is a direction we should take, minimise sugar, etc. But you've got over 10 million people worldwide every day that feed their families because they're involved in the sugar cane farming industry. India has just put a billion dollars into their sugarcane industry to, to lead the world in sugarcane production a couple of weeks ago. The UN is meeting on it next week because they're concerned about India's rise in the sugarcane industry. What are we doing then to either assist them to diversify so that sugarcane can be used for other products or do they actually want to get into another product but they're fourth and fifth sugarcane generation farmers so they're doing what they know what to do? Yeah, look, I, I, I think these things need to be considered by, by government. In Australia, actually, the majority of our sugar is exported. So, you know, I, I think about an argument to any kind of change in whether, you know, we have a sugar sweetened beverage tax or sugar labelling here often, um, you know, gets confounded by the fact that the, the sugar growers wouldn't hugely be affected by um, any changes we have here. But, you know, this is why we need to have, you know, whole of government approaches that look at how we shift the food system. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we, we should have, you know, all growers at the table as well. You know, we have really powerful food and beverage industry. We never see the likes of Ausveg or the, of the growers being involved in conversations about food. So, look, it's certainly a, a consideration and, and, you know, we, we do have to transition to, to industries that are more sustainable for our population in regards to health. Thank you. We've got, well, I'll just hold on, we've got 28 questions online um, and there's, we've got eight minutes left. Um, but what I want to do is just ask a couple that have been sitting at the top of this list, um, really, really popular. If we've got a chance, we'll come back to a couple of people I know who've got a, a question at the end. Um, there's a really practical one here for you, Zach. Um, in terms of food bank, how can everyday homes contribute to helping people who are food insecure or is this something that can only be done from businesses? No, absolutely. People at home can uh, support Food Bank Victoria. Um, the biggest drivers, um, you know, on meeting demand for food uh, relief in Australia is awareness, foods and funds. So if you're at home and you're wanting to help out um, Food Bank, you can talk about us, you can um, tell people about us, you can organise a local food drive at your, at your local school or in your workplace or at home, or you can support us online um, uh, with donations. So that's how I'd suggest. The other way is volunteering, so that I should have mentioned, sorry. Um, a lot of the frontline charities that are working in the community, so we're like, um, I guess we're like Victoria's pantry. We sort of source and um, and distribute, you know, 8 million kilos of food. We do that through a community network of partners, about 450 across the state. So they are, you know, your Salvation Armies, your St Vincent de Pauls, your community centres that are working in community and they're using the power of food to kind of um, uh, bring their community engage and then help with um, sort of case management. So, you know, they're 
woefully under-resourced, uh, and one of the biggest things they, re um, you know, they rely on is volunteering. So I'd suggest, uh, you know, volunteering at a local charity where, you know, I think 40% of our partners rely exclusively on volunteers. Um, so if you're wanting something practical to do, get it, you know, get out and help. But it'd be, um, you'd be surprised at the difference you could be um, making. That's great. Thank you, Zach. Uh, another question here is around looking at mental health. Um, so food and nutrition, and we know the implications it has on our physical health, that's been well known for a long time. We're starting to learn a lot more about the impact it has on our mental health. Um, so what is it, I guess, that we can do to empower individuals um, around making some behaviour change that will help their mental health as well? Once again, I'm going to say education. Uh, it's education, education, education. I mean, once we start this, if we can get into schools and start this on a basic level, um, it's surely going to help. I've been on a, this eating only vegetables for, well, a little bit of protein, but a lot of vegetables for the past few weeks. I've been feeling amazingly calm <laughs> compared to normal. Um, and it's amazing that it can have that impact on you, like unusually calm. It's great. <laughs> It's, it's a big it's a big topic yes, it's, a, absolutely. it's a big question absolutely I think I mean it's just repeating the obvious you know but beyond education I think it's probably just the the infiltration of that information you know for, like for those of us in this sector we might have known for a few years we've experimented ourselves you know I know myself if I'm getting down I need to cut the carbs for a few weeks and everything's mm. you know gonna get back to normal so but we've probably had years and kind of awareness and you know thinking a lot about food and i don't think that that message is out there kind of in the mainstream at all like i don't think people like depression and anxiety at absolutely you know chronic kind of levels in society and the the sort of medicalization of that and even to suggest that you know diet can make a big difference yeah i don't know what they kind of potential campaigns or how that story gets out for people to really understand that. We have a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings about how to get that word out there. And um, one of the things we came up with recently, which we'll probably pitch this week, is that we do a, uh, we try and take over a season of MasterChef because that's how you get the word out there. Mm -hmm. We did cooking demonstrations of the Royal Melbourne Show of um, both healthy cooking for adults and healthy cooking for kids. Most of the people, about 80% of the people that came up and watched it were like they were watching TV. So they were, um, a lot were large people sitting down with their fairy floss and hamburger and Coke, whole families sitting there watching us cook healthy food. It was amazing. And so one clever way I think would be to get in there and actually rather than getting all these chefs competing and I'm not talking about getting everyone, well, everyone to make quinoa salads, you can make amazingly good food not using um, huge amounts of fats and, and what have you. So that would be a challenge we would put to them. Wish us yep. luck. <laughs> Maybe it's like the happiest loser or something. The happiest loser. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Can I ask uh, just a closing question uh, for all of you? And I think I'm, I'm really excited by the conversation today, by the questions that have been coming in from people uh, present uh, as well as those online. People are really keen on the practical. So yes, it's really complicated. There are a whole lot of power influences all over the place. Can each of you maybe give one practical thing that each person who's here today or is engaged in this conversation can walk away and do um, as a result? I can do one. <laughs> Confident that my answer will be rounded out by the rest of the panel. <laughs> Go to either openfoodnetwork.org.au or seriesfairfood.org.au or one of the many other sources and work out where your food is coming from and buy it from a farmer or from an ethical organisation that is supporting farmers and sustainable food production. Adding on to there, I would say if you have a family, friends, whatever, loved ones, whatever, take them to such a farmer's market or yeah. somewhere, buy produce together, educating your kids or even friends if they don't know much about food. Make it fun. Eating should be fun. Don't, you know, lecture people on things. Mm -hmm. And then go home and cook together. Put the phones away, have a glass of wine, not with the kids, of course, and, <laughs> um, and make it enjoyable. And, and it really does bring people together. And that has a knock-on effect which is also just about being able to tell the stories of where that food has come from. Like, that's part of the fun, part of the celebration. I've made so much more progress with my family over the last few years by being able to give them things that taste delicious and tell them where it's from and get them excited about, mm. you know, the story of it. 
Yeah, and I would say if you want to see a change in the food system, just get active, even if it's just an email or even try and pick up the phone. Like, I know it seems really um, scary to do something like that, but if you have a few pointers in front of you, um, call call the relevant decision maker's office. And if you want to do something right now, um, write a letter for our Add a Sugar campaign just to even start getting engaged in the process because if lots of people do these actions, then we will get change on really important issues. And once you've done it once, it gets easier yes. than you to start rolling rolling them out all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, different things resonate for different people. Uh, you know, you, you know, sustainability, your diet choices, you know, your love of cooking. Um, and I think, you know, individually, if you're going to take something away from this, maybe it is just to question your own food choices. So start at that point and question, well, am I comfortable with the status quo? Am I comfortable shopping where I shop? Am I comfortable with my diet? And then do some reading about it. That's that's where I'd start, I reckon. Question your own, question your own food choices. I recently, you know, as a reformed marine biologist, you know, <laughs> one of my favourite food experiences was eating sushi in uh, in you know the fish markets in Tokyo. That's horrible of me to have done that. I should not have, you know, eaten that that tuna. It was sensational at the time, but it gets you thinking. You know, you know, what do I want to um, uh, do with my food choices? So I think, you know, question your own choice on food. I think that's important because it can sometimes seem really overwhelming and you sometimes when you try and do everything it can get too much so yeah find the thing that's important to you and then do your research and try and you know focus on that particular area you mean it's just too difficult to be good and do everything you know perfect in every single area so just start with something small. Can I just add to that I think over the years it's become really important to me to not be a purist like the worst thing that you can do is like be beating yourself up over everything and certainly not beating other people up over everything because that just gets you nowhere. So, you know, do the best you can and sometimes enjoy a piece of tuna and just go, well, this is just what's happening today. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to finish. Uh, I think in short, I, I guess I take away from that that there's actually lots of right things we could do as a next step and that's a good thing. Um, so any one of those ideas may have resonated differently with each of us, but there certainly are things that we, um, as simply as thinking about the, ch the food choices we make, the places where we go to shop, or even stepping up um, and taking on more of an advocacy role um, to our authorities to say that we do want change, um, that change is possible in this space. So um, thank you so much to our four speakers. If you can all join with me in thanking them all. Um, so, so Toby, Zach, Katinka and Kirsten. Um, we've had a real diversity of experiences, backgrounds and perspectives shared today. Um, I think judging by the feeling in the room, the online activity as well, we could have uh, continued this session for a lot longer um, than we did. But that's a, that's a great thing. I really appreciate your perspectives being shared with everybody. So thank you. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's engaged in this conversation. As I said, there's probably about 150 people here um, in person, similar numbers online. Um, and that's just a fantastic result uh, for our organisation. So the organising teams at, at Vic Health and the Sandro De Mayo Foundation uh, pulling this event together is fantastic and also working together on upcoming Festival 21. Uh, you'll see more collaboration between us. Um, so thank you. We, I guess, be really open about it. Your upcoming food choices have been entirely determined by us uh, and street catering at the back of the room there. Um, as you leave, please, please stop and grab something to eat and drink if you'd like to and have a chat uh, with colleagues. So thank you so much. <laughs>